Amen. But I'm going to wrap up tonight our Wednesday night midweek series that we've been in now for, believe it or not, 11 weeks. And uh, this is the 11th session that we've had together. And uh, there's some more that I could probably talk about after this, but I, I think I'm going to put a cap on it tonight, all right? So we're going to go to the book of Nehemiah. If you've got your Bibles, let's turn together to the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. And uh, we are going to be reading about the last gate that Nehemiah built. Nehemiah, and um, this is probably the most exciting of all the ones that we have talked about. Amen. Nehemiah chapter number 3. And again, as I have been doing, I'm just going to read verse one verse for our text tonight. It's going to be the 29th verse. Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse number 29. If you have it, say amen. The Bible said that Zadok, after them Zadok, the son of Emir, made repairs in front of his own house. And after him Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, made repairs. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The last 11 weeks, we've been talking about how to build a life that will last. And I've been trying as we've gone through the book of Nehemiah to give you spiritual principles out of a physical example. Nehemiah is rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. You are rebuilding the life that God wants you to live. How many want a life that is solid? Let me hear you say amen. I mean solid, someone that is strong, somebody that is stable. And it is the will of God for you and I to get there. It's the will of God for the church to be strong. Amen. God doesn't want a weak church. He doesn't want an impotent church. He wants a church that is powerful. Amen. And so these spiritual principles that we've been trying to give to you are there to help you, to lead you to that kind of life. So we've gone around the city of Jerusalem. We've talked about the sheep gate, talking about the blood of Jesus. We've talked about the fish gate, your influence for the cause of Christ. We've talked about the valley gate, the difficult times. We've talked about the, uh, the, the um, uh, dung gate. After you go through the valley, you've got to rid yourself of all of the impurities in the flesh, and you've got to be sanctified. And we've talked about the water or the fountain gate, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And, of course, last week we talked about the horse gate. Tonight we come to the last gate, not only physically but spiritually in our experience with God. Because everything that we've talked about has led us to this point. This is the most exciting moment in the life of a child of God. And the reason it's the most exciting moment is because this is the moment for which you and I live on this earth. And let me tell you, church, we can get so caught up in the here and the now and the current that we forget we've got a better day that is coming. We can get so caught up in the battles that you are facing. How many in this room tonight, you're fighting some battles? Let me see you raise your hand. It's okay. You're fighting some battles. You've got some opposition. We can get so caught up in the opposition that we forget this battle is not going to last forever. There is coming a day in which the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and we are going to be rescued, raptured, and redeemed from this world, never again to experience all of the weakness of this world, we will forever be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many are looking forward to that day? And so as we talk about the East Gate, we are going to talk about that moment in time. Now, the reason we have to talk about it, put this in your notes here, is because if we live only for now, if we live only for the current, the present, the temporal, we will never experience everything that God wants us to experience. I think many times we get so caught up in the here and the now. And I really feel like many are so caught up in the battle that you are fighting that you forget what lies on the other side. Now, Paul told Titus, get your Bible. We're going to go through the scriptures. I'm going to give you a lot of Bible tonight, a lot of verses tonight. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, Paul writes that the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. How many believe grace teaches you something? 
Amen. So many in this world are using grace as a crutch and a means by which to say, I can live any way that I please. No, Paul said, grace teaches me to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And the reason is, is because I am looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, in, this, in these verses here, what Paul does is he breaks apart our complete salvation experience. Number one, we are justified by grace. Grace is has redeemed and justified you from the penalty of sin. How many are glad you no longer are under the death penalty? Amen. He has justified you by grace, but not only that, he went on to say that you live righteously, soberly, and godly. That gives us, grace gives us, the power or the freedom from the power of sin. We are no longer slaves, prisoners to sin. That means we are sanctified. But one of these days, one of these days, we are going to be set free from the very presence of sin, which means we are going to be glorified glorified. And church, do not ever forget the fact that one of these days, no longer will you have to turn on the television and see the debauchery of sin being belched out by the enemy. But one of these days, we are going to be in a place where there is perfect righteousness, perfect peace, perfect truth, and everything revolves around the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why we live the way that we do. Can you shout amen? You say, Pastor, why does the church have to live separate from the world? It's because this world is not our home. And if you feel more comfortable in the world than you do in the church, that simply means that you are not really where you should be spiritually because this world is the antithesis of everything that we believe. Amen. You cannot get comfortable. We are going to be glorified out of this world, and we live in this expectation. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about the rapture. I'm talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, anytime I begin to talk about things like this, I I always wrestle within myself, and maybe it's just the flesh uh, that tells me, Pastor, they know everything. They know all that. That's too simple. That's no, you know what? Sometimes we need to be reminded of the core fundamentals of the Word of God. And we're living in a day that focuses so much uh, on what I can do just to get into next week that we forget what we need to do to get in to eternity. And I believe we need to get back to the preaching of the fundamentals of the Word of God. So I'm going to talk to you about the rapture tonight. Is that all right? I'm going to talk to you about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe the Lord is going to encourage you tonight. And you're going to leave this place believing that this present trouble that you're in, the present pain that you are enduring, is worth it because Jesus is coming again. Amen. The Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16, that one of these days the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. How many believe that is a reality? Let me hear you shout amen. Paul said this is a verse that ought to comfort you. He said comfort one another, encourage one another with these words. My mission tonight is to encourage you. Amen. I want you to be comforted. I want you to be encouraged, amen, because this is the most powerful message that can ever be preached. Now, you say, Pastor, how does that tie in to Nehemiah chapter number 3? How does that fit into the eastern gate? Well, let me give you some background. The eastern gate is also called the golden gate. It is a place that faces the Mount of Olives on the eastern side of the old city of Jerusalem. Every time that I go to Jerusalem, and I can't wait to go again in November, but one of the highlights to me of the whole tour, and there's so much that is so good to see, but one of the highlights is when I'm able to take the group to the Mount of Olives, and we start descending down the Mount of Olives. And there is a certain point on the Mount of Olives at which we stop where we get a panoramic view of the city of Jerusalem. 
and we stop there, and we can see the eastern gate on the old city of Jerusalem. And it's there that I begin to talk about the eastern gate to the group. And I tell you, we've had some of the most anointed times on the Mount of Olives because the eastern gate has such a powerful spiritual significance to it. Here's why. Because Jewish religious tradition teaches that the coming Jewish Messiah is going to enter into the city of Jerusalem through the eastern gate. That has been now for centuries, what the decades, millenniums, they have believed that their coming Messiah. Understand now, the Jews did not receive Jesus as their Messiah. They are still waiting on their Messiah, and they believe. And I, when I talk to the Jewish guides there in Israel, they too will tell me we are waiting on our Messiah. And when I preach to the to the group, uh, my tour, I preach that Jesus is going to come through that gate, and the Jewish guide comes and tells me, well, we believe our Messiah is going to come through that gate. He is going to come through that gate. And you see, that is why In the 1500s, the Muslim Ottoman Turks, when they captured the city of Jerusalem, they sealed up the eastern gate. Go ahead and, yeah, there you go. They sealed up the eastern gate in the 1500s. And they sealed up that eastern gate to keep the Messiah from coming into the city of Jerusalem. They thought that by building a brick wall to seal, that is the only gate in the old city that is sealed. All of them have access. All of them are open and all of them are used on an everyday basis except the eastern gate. Now, not only did they seal up that gate to keep the Messiah from coming in, but they also, if you can see, put a cemetery in front of that gate. Strategically, they buried dead bodies in front of that gate because of the history that says no conquering king is going to walk through a cemetery to go and to conquer a city. So they think by sealing the gate and by putting dead bodies in front of the gate, they are going to keep the Messiah from coming into the city of Jerusalem. But what they did not realize is that this is no ordinary Messiah that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Messiah that that said, I am the resurrection and the life. And when Jesus comes, the power of life, amen, always wins over the power of death. And there is no dead body and there is no sealed gate that is going to keep the Lord Jesus Christ from coming into the city of Jerusalem and setting up his kingdom as King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. I tell you that because, friend, there is no demonic spirit of hell that will ever stand in the way of Jesus being the victorious king of kings. And if you, my friend, are in Christ, I want you to know on this Wednesday night that there is no demonic spirit of hell that can keep you from victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He can try to seal up your fate, and he can try to seal up your faith, and he can try to put dead spirits in front of you. But in Jesus, the Bible said, I have been made more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus our Lord and tonight you are victorious if you receive it shout amen hallelujah praise God Jesus came into this gate many times as he passed through the city of Jerusalem but in particular 30 AD he descends out of the Mount of Olives down the Mount of Olives Luke chapter number 19 says, when he was come nigh, even at the descent of the Mount of Olives, uh, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works uh, that they had seen. Now, why did they praise him? They praised him because they thought that he was coming to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem at that time. But you see, God's time did not match their time. And the moment that Jesus did not set up his kingdom, five days later, what did they do? They nailed him to a tree and crucified him. The Jews rejected him as their Messiah. 
And that is why their eyes have been blinded. And they are still waiting on their Messiah. They crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is interesting is to see that at that moment in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus, when he entered the city, he made this statement in verse number 39. He said, you will not see me henceforth until ye say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, Jesus said, I'm not coming back into this city through this gate until you, as the Jews, recognize me as your Messiah. And that is why, my friend, there is coming a day that Israel is going to be saved again. You say, Pastor, why do we support Israel? I tell you why we support Israel. They are God's chosen people, and just because they rejected Jesus, it has not thwarted the plan of redemption that God has for mankind, and the grace of God, it will one day be turned again to the nation of Israel. And I've said it once, I'll say it again. The United States of America must stand with the nation of Israel if we want to be blessed We must bless the people of God. How many believe it? Uh, Hallelujah. Because the Bible said, look in Romans chapter number 11 and verse 25. Paul said, I would not, brethren, that you would be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit that blindness in part has happened to Israel even until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. In other words, because they rejected Jesus, God then turned his plan of redemption to the Gentiles. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God had mercy on the Gentile nations. Amen. I am glad that just because somebody rejected Jesus, God's plan of redemption Amen. It still went on. And because they rejected him now, Jesus built with the Gentiles a church. Amen. A church that the Bible said will not have spot or wrinkle. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm telling you, church, we are not just some political gathering. We are the living body of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ, are you glad for that? Until that time is over, then there will come, back in Romans 11, out of Zion, the deliverer, and will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant unto them when I take away their sins. God will not break his covenant with Israel, and he will not break his covenant with you. He is a covenant God. Now, when that happens, he will then, when that work of the church is finished, God is still working on the church. Look at your neighbor and say, he's still working on you. Don't say he's got a lot of work to do, but he's still working on me. He is working on the church. Jesus is perfecting the church. Hear me now. If you miss everything, let me tell you, Jesus is wanting us to go to the next level in the realm of the Spirit. We sang about it tonight, about moving from glory to glory. Listen, I'm not content where we are spiritually. God wants us to go to the next level. Amen. I wasn't going to say this, but I had a conversation with somebody. And this today, just today, the statement was made about how we say, oh, God, come down. Come down and bless us. Come down and touch us. You know what? God's saying, no, I don't want to come down. I want you to go up. I want you to come up. And that thought came to me as that individual made that statement. I thought, you know what? Jesus has already come down. He came down 2,000 years ago and did everything that needed to be done so that I could rise in the realm of the Spirit, being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb as a child of the Most High God, as a king and as a priest unto God. I can ascend into heavenly places. Jesus came down so that I could go up. Amen. That's why Paul said you are seated, Ephesians 2. You are seated together with Christ in heavenly places. Amen. Church, Jesus is working on us so that we can get better, we can get higher, we can get stronger and move into the heavenly realms. Amen. That's why we're here tonight. That's why we're here tonight. It's so your spirit can be elevated in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's working on you. Now, when that time is done, 
When he's done working on us, that means he's going to come and he's going to take us out of what I can say, the workshop, this earth. He is going to rapture us. And then when he is done with the church, he is then going to turn his grace again toward Israel. He is going to turn his face again toward the Jewish people. Now, again, the first time my wife and I went to Jerusalem, the only way that we could describe it was I felt like we were coming home. People say, how do you feel when you go to Israel? I feel like I'm going home. You know why? Because spiritually, we have been grafted in to the nation of Israel, and we have become part of this. Oh, my God, if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. I have been grafted in as part of the covenant people of God himself, and now I am spiritually a Jew, and I receive all that which has been promised in the covenant of the word of God. Everything that God God promised, amen, I have become a recipient through the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. I was just reading today my devotions where God told the Israelites, the Jewish people in the book of Deuteronomy, it's not going to be on the screen, I'm just going to tell you. He said, I'm going to make you the head and not the tail. He said, you're going to be above and not beneath, You say, Pastor, you can't claim that. That's Old Testament. That's for the Jews. Brother, when Jesus came and shed his blood, amen, and I I was redeemed by his blood, I was grafted in as a Jew. And so, brother, whatever is promised, amen, to the Jews, I'm going to take it as from God, and I'm going to say I am the head, and I am not the tail. I am above, and I am not beneath. So do not let this world stomp all over you. You have got authority in the name of Jesus. Jesus, get up and be the head spiritually that God has created for you to be. Amen. Y'all understand what I'm saying tonight? God is a covenant God. I said he is a covenant God. What he said he will do for you because it is written in his covenant. And so therefore, by the blood, I receive that covenant. Amen. I may not get preaching about the rapture tonight. You've got to receive the covenant. Come on, somebody, receive the covenant, amen. Hallelujah. How many receive it? said, how many receive it? He's a covenant God. You spiritually are a Jew. You have been grafted in. And so when that work with the church is done, God will turn his eyes, his face again to Israel. But this time, it's going to be different. Because it is going to be a time of wrath. It is going to be a time of judgment. And that's why I go to the book of Daniel chapter number 9 and verse number 24. Daniel prophesied, speaking to the Jews, he said, 70 weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end to sin. And to make reconciliation, here it is, reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint, get this, to anoint the most holy. Now, I can't go into the 70 weeks, but the 70th week, the 70th seven, the 70th period of seven years is yet to come. 69 weeks, 69 periods of seven years have been fulfilled, but the 70th is yet to come. And it is that seven-year period of tribulation that God has appointed to the Jewish people. That is where he is going to woo them, and through that wrath and through that judgment, he is going to open their eyes, and they will see Jesus as their Messiah. Now, let me tell you something, church. We are closer to that moment than we have ever been and we need to realize how close we are to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see the spirit of Antichrist that is spreading throughout the world. And there, it is very, very easy for me to understand because of how immersed we are with personality that all the Antichrist has to do is take the world platform in a time of crisis, speaking words that are suave and anointed by the devil himself, and the world will flock and will begin to worship him. We are close to that moment 
moment right here and right now. And it is this seven-year period in which now God will, get, will again turn his attention to the Jewish people. Now, the eastern gate, though, when Jesus comes back, as I said, will be that gate through which he enters the city. Now, notice this. Ezekiel, go to Ezekiel chapter number 44. Ezekiel prophesied that this gate would be sealed. He said the gate will be shut. It will not be opened. No man will enter in by it. Now notice, this gate did not get sealed until the 1500s, after Christ. But Ezekiel prophesied that it would be shut. No man would enter. Why? Because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore, it will be shut because it is for the prince. The prince who will sit in it to eat bread before the Lord, he will enter by the way of the porch of that gate, and he will go out by the way of the same. In other words, Ezekiel said this gate is reserved for Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, let's go deeper than that. Notice that the proximity of this gate is by the Mount of Olives. Why do we say the eastern gate talks about the second coming? Because it is located, as I said, next to the Mount of Olives. Amen. Again, one of the most memorable days is that moment we can look on the Mount of Olives from that point and look at the eastern gate. And it was 2,000 years ago that Jesus stood on the hillside on the Mount of Olives and he overlooked the city of Jerusalem. And he made prophecies that forever changed the history of the world. Amen. On the Mount of Olives, this is a literal picture, obviously, of the Mount of This is the Mount of Olives right now. Those are graves. For centuries, it is the oldest cemetery in the world. Dating back a couple of thousands of years, Jewish people have been buried there. It is the most popular place for Jewish people to be buried. You know why? Because they believe that when the Messiah comes, they want to be the first to come with him and be raised up. And so all of these graves on the Mount of Olives are looking down on the eastern gate from the west. Now, why do I say the Mount of Olives? Because it is from the Mount of Olives that Jesus said his final words to the disciples in Acts chapter 1, and he ascended into heaven. He ascended from the Mount of Olives. And it is to that same mount that Jesus will return in these last days. It could be the same spot. It could be the same point. But Jesus strategically chose the Mount of Olives to ascend into heaven. And he is now coming the second time to the same mount overlooking the eastern gate. This is an event that literally is, is so cataclysmic that we cannot imagine. Jesus prophesied, Matthew chapter 24, look at this in verse 40. He said, two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, be ready. Everybody shout the word ready. He said, be ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Let me tell you, church, we cannot get comfortable living in this world. We cannot get comfortable because at any moment, and I believe the coming of the Lord, it is imminent, which means it could happen at absolutely any second. It could happen before we leave this house tonight. And that is why we cannot become lackadaisical or apathetic in our faith. We have got to constantly keep our eyes set to the eastern sky because Jesus is coming at any moment. How many believe it? Shout amen. Now, ironically, where do you think Jesus did that teaching from? The Mount of Olives. Every day you see more headlines in our news fulfilling that which was spoken thousands of years ago by the prophets of Scripture. Now, why am I preaching this? I'm preaching this because there was a day when, when you went to church, the five cardinal doctrines of the church were preached. The deity and the virgin birth of Christ, the atonement of man, the inspiration and the inerrancy of Scripture, divine healing, and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, 
this is a subject that is not touched on enough within the house of God. I don't know why, but it seems as though preaching has become more about popularity and soothing our flesh. I believe we need to get back to preaching the doctrines of the Word of God. Preaching about the blood of Jesus. Preaching about divine healing. Preaching about the miraculous signs of the Holy Spirit. Preaching about the conviction of the Holy Spirit against sin. And I realize it's not popular to preach against sin. But brother, sin is still taking people to hell every single moment that we live. And we can make people comfortable. But we will make them comfortable on their way to hell. How about we preach the word of God and see their soul saved by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The second coming. It's a subject that is so immense, I cannot cover it tonight. But I want to give you a couple of things. Number one, let me differentiate between the second coming and what we call the rapture. The rapture is different than the second coming. The rapture, I've already read it in 1 Thessalonians 4, is when Jesus returns for his church. The revelation is when Jesus returns with his church. There will be a seven-year period between the two events. In eschatology, these two events appear to be similar, but they are separate. Both happen during the end time, and both describe a return of Christ, but yet there are key differences. Notice this, the rapture is a meeting that is in the air. During the rapture, Jesus does not come back to the earth. That is why it is not called the second coming. But rather, according to the scripture, he meets us in the air. Verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians 4. Paul said, we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I don't know how it's going to happen. You say, Pastor, how in the world? In fact, I've had people that say they are believers uh, that they do not believe in a literal rapture. They say this is something that is, that is just uh, theoretical. It is symbolic. Brother, I can't explain how it's going to happen. But what I do know is what the Bible said. And if the Bible said we are going to meet the Lord in the air, then I believe we are going to meet the Lord in the air. It is not symbolic. It is not theoretical. It is a literal rapturing where, the, where, where this whole power of gravity will lose its hold and suddenly, the Bible said in a moment in the twinkling of an eye millions of people around the world will disappear with no explanation from CNN Fox or NBC they will not understand how because it is a miraculous supernatural touch of the Holy Ghost that raptures the bride of Christ out of this world brother it gets me excited to know that I'm going to meet Jesus in the middle of the cloud in the most dramatic, amen, happening in the history of the world, amen. Brother, I don't care if you understand it. I don't understand it. But just because you do not understand it does not give you the right to deny it. There's a lot of things in the Bible we don't understand. But by faith that we know that it is real, brother, he's coming again. I said, he's coming again. Whereas the revelation, it is not a meeting in the air, but rather it is a victorious return with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 14 that the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine white clean linen. That is the redeemed saints of God. Seven years after we have been raptured and spent time in heaven, amen, the revelation of Christ, he will come to the earth again and he will come with one reason and that is for the Israelites, the Jewish people to see him as their Messiah. Now, I believe the rapture happens before the tribulation. And I realize that in eschatology, there are a lot of different opinions. And that is okay. If you want to stay during the tribulation, you go right ahead. I don't want to. 
And I realize there are many that have a difference of opinion. But I base my opinion on this word that God said, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 9, that God hath not appointed us to wrath, but rather to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the seven-year period of tribulation is the outpouring of the wrath of God on this earth. It will be a time where hell literally will be unleashed on this earth. Amen. I've done a, I've done a study with the church be, with, through the entire book of Revelation. I might do it again sometime. But when you begin to understand, amen, the, just the, 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 the vastness of evil that is going to be unleashed on this earth, Brother, you don't want to be here. I said, you don't want to be here. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit will not restrain any longer evil from the devil. The devil will have free reign, and the wrath of God will be poured out on the sin and the iniquity of this world. Let me tell you, church, we are living in grace right now. We ought to be thankful for it. I said, we are living in grace right now. But there's coming a day, please hear me now, there's coming a day when grace will end. And when grace ends, judgment is going to come. And the Bible said, I'm not appointed to that wrath. You know why? Because Jesus took it for me. He took the wrath of God when he went to the cross. The wrath of God was poured out on him because of sin. And now when I receive Jesus, he has taken the wrath of God for me. And so therefore, I believe that I'm going to be out of here before the wrath of God is poured out. Do you understand what I'm saying? Shout amen. Jesus himself said, Look at the word salvation in that verse. Salvation means deliverance from the molestation of enemies. When you read the book of Revelation, and I know oh, that's, just, that's just figurative, Pastor. That's just, no, no, no. There are some literal things that are going to happen. There will be demons that are in the form of scorpions. I just had a conversation with my kids about this the other day. You think, man, you talk to your kids about that? Well, yeah, it's real. It's real. There will be demonic spirits in the form of scorpions that will sting men, and men will not, they will cry out wanting to die and will not be able to die. It is going to be the most horrific time. My question is, why would God allow his blood-bought, redeemed church to go through that which he is pouring out on the world because of sin when our sins have already been covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Revelation chapter number 3 and verse 10, he said, because you've kept the word of my patience, I'm going to keep you from the hour, notice the singularity of that word, the hour of temptation, which shall come upon what? All the world. This is the only time in which wrath is poured out on all the world at one time. There's been times of famine. There's been times of temptation in certain parts of the world. But at this point, there will be the entirety of the globe that is under the hour of temptation. Listen, during the tribulation, there will be nowhere for you to run. There will be nowhere for you to hide. But Jesus said, because you kept my word, I'm going to keep you from that hour. I believe we're going home before the tribulation. The revelation comes after the tribulation. I've already said it will be at the end of that seven years. I've got to hurry. The rapture is a hidden event. In other words, the world will not know what happened. The Bible said, 1 Corinthians 15 and 52, Paul said, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you and I will not have time to repent when you hear the trumpet sound. I will not have time to say that I'm sorry. It will be a split second, and Jesus will have raptured the entire church off of this world. Now, the word rapture is not even used in the Bible. You will not find the word rapture, but the literal meaning of the word is caught up. 
The Latin word rapto, meaning R-A-P-T-O, means to seize or to carry off. Kenneth West is a Greek scholar. He gives various meanings of that same Greek word rapture or caught up. One meaning is to catch away speedily. Meaning just like he caught Philip away. The spirit lifted Philip up and translated him in the book of Acts. Just like that. Another meaning is to claim for one's own self. I believe the rapture is Jesus saying, I am so ready to be with my bride. I can't wait any longer. And the father says, go get your bride. And the groom and the bride are united. Oh, let me tell you, there's a wedding day that is coming that you and I are going to celebrate with our groom, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The rapture is him claiming us as his own. Hallelujah. Another meaning is to move to a new place. Paul used this word when he was translated into heaven, 2 Corinthians 12. The rapture is a hidden event. Nobody will see it. Nobody will know it. One second you will be there. The next second you'll be gone. But the revelation, everybody will see. The Bible says in Revelation 1 and 7, that behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. You say, Pastor, how has that happened? I tell you, with technology, you can easily see how this can happen. This world is a connected world. And I love technology. But I'm going to tell you, the devil is going to use technology during, during the tribulation period. But every eye is going to see him. And the Bible said that they which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth, they will wail because of him. He will come in such power. The revelation is going to be seen by everybody. The rapture could happen at any moment. Titus 2 and 13, we say we look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Theologians call this the doctrine of the imminent return of Christ. Imminent re- means it can happen at any moment, which means you do not try to set a date for the rapture. Let me say it again. Do not try to set a date for the rapture because no man knows the hour. Now, the revelation will not happen until certain events take place. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse number 3, let no man deceive you. That day the revelation will not come except there's a falling away first. And that man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. In other words, the Antichrist must be revealed before the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. What about the resurrection of the dead? Paul said the Lord is going to descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. People always wonder about this. Does this mean then that what about all the decaying bodies? What about those bodies that were dismembered? What about, what about this and what about that? You've got to understand something. When, when Paul talks about the resurrection, amen, he is not talking about a reconstruction. Meaning that he is not meaning that all the elements of the body are going to be put back in place. People say, is it wrong to donate an organ? No, I don't think it's wrong. You say, well, pastor, but what about, what about the resurrection? You see, you've got to understand this. This is not a reconstruction. Resurrection does not mean he's going to put all the elements of the body. I want you to understand it's like this. Resurrection is like the seed, the growing of a plant from the seed. When you plant a seed and that seed grows into a flower, does the flower look like the seed? No. But is it the same plant? Yes. It is the same plant, which means the body that goes into the ground is just like the seed. But the resurrected body, amen, it may not exactly look like your physical body, but it's going to be a glorified body like the Lord Jesus Christ. We are going to have a perfected body like the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the rapture, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. What's going to happen? Three things. Number one, Jesus is going to give a shout. He is going to give a shout, I believe comparable to what he did outside the tomb of Lazarus, John 11 and 43. He said those in the graves are going to hear his voice. You're going to hear the sound of a trumpet. The Jewish people are familiar with trumpets because trumpets were used to declare war, to announce special seasons and times. To the Romans, trumpets announced the arrival of a great person. The voice of the archangel, the only archangel that is named in the Bible is Michael in Jude verse number 9. Michael has a special ministry 
to the nation of Israel. Now, whether it's Michael or not, I do not know. I believe it probably will be, simply be because of his affinity with the nation of Israel. But brother, there's going to be a shout from the Lord Jesus Christ. There's going to be a trumpet that sounds, and there's going to be the voice of the archangel, all in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye, and the translation of the church is going to take place, and we now forever will be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All that we do, all that we say, all that we are moves us to this point. I want you to be ready for the rapture. Can you shout amen? And friend, tonight as I close, there was a quaint inscription on a gravestone in an old British cemetery not far from Windsor Castle. And it read this. It said, pause, my friend, as you walk by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare, my friend, to follow me. But I heard about a visitor who read that epitaph, and he added these words. To follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. Can I just say this, my friend? It's either heaven or hell. There is no in-between. There is no purgatory. There is no praying your uncle out of purgatory. You're either right or you're not. And friend, if this is as plain as I can make it tonight, Jesus is coming again. I said, Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. Let the world scoff. Let them laugh. Let them mock. But one of these days, every eye will see him. They will behold him in his glory. They will behold him in his righteousness.